Now let's look at the two that I'm going to suggest you do memorize. The first one is called evenly spaced scores. This happens when the difference between first and second is the same as the difference between second and third. In other words, second is halfway between first and third. Here's a recent example. We have Parker in the lead with 16,400, Kristen in second with 13,000, and Natalie in third with 9,600. If you look at the difference between Parker and Kristen's scores, it's 3,400. And the difference between Kristen and Natalie's scores is also 3,400. Therefore, these scores are evenly spaced. So what should each player do? And we'll work through this one rather quickly. Parker needs to wager at least 9,600 to cover a double up by Kristen. If Parker gets it wrong, she'll have 6,800, so Kristen can wager no more than 6,200. Kristen can wager 3,400 to cover a zero wager by Parker. Now to second and third. Kristen will need to wager at least 6,200 to cover an all-in by Natalie. But that's already her maximum wager, so that means that's what she has to wager. If Kristen gets it wrong, Natalie can wager no more than 2,800 to stay above her total. Now for first and third. If Parker gets it wrong, she'll have 6,800. And that's the same score that Natalie's already trying to stay above. Now we turn to rule number four, which says that if someone has to wager something, you might want to tweak your bet. If Kristen gets it wrong, she'll have 6,800. And if Parker gets it wrong with that 9,600 wager, she'll also have 6,800. So that should be her only wager. So here are our scores. And remember corollary number four. Do we have any alternative wagers that these players can make? Well, if Kristen wagers 6,200 like she's supposed to, Natalie could double up and tie her. And if Parker wagers 9,600 like she's supposed to, Kristen, in theory, could double up to tie her. But what do you do? Well, a lot of it depends on what you think the other players will do. Our second scenario is when first place equals the sum of the second and third place scores. Here's an example that's near and dear to my heart. Arthur Gandolfi, who beat me in the Tournament of Champions, has 24,600. Janice is in second with 13,800, and Sean is in third with 10,800. You'll see the sum of 13,800 and 10,800 equals 24,600, so we have that scenario here. Arthur needs to wager at least 3,000 to cover a double up by Janice. But you'll notice that if Arthur gets it wrong with that wager, he'll have 21,600, which is exactly what Sean would have if he were to double up. Therefore, Arthur doesn't want to risk falling below him, so he should cap his wager at the very minimum, 3,000. Sean and Janice should both wager everything in the hopes of tying Arthur. And in fact, Arthur did wager for the tie, and Janice recognized the scenario as well. They both came back for another game. Now why do I suggest that you learn these two formulas when you could just figure them out on the fly? The answer is a situation I like to call the penultimate wager when someone finds the daily double on the last clue of double jeopardy. Now here's a situation from the first game of season 30. We have Jared in the lead with 18,800, Angela in second with 14,400, and James in third with 12,600. But James has found the daily double on the last clue of double jeopardy. So he can control his own destiny in a lot of ways by setting himself up to tie. Now, maybe he wants to take the lead. If he wants to take the lead, he'll have to wager at least 6,200. Is there a way that he could wager? So that if he gets it wrong with a big wager, he'll be in a tie situation? Now, which of those tie scenarios do you think would work here? I think we could get first equals second plus third to work here. The difference between Jared and Angela is 4,400. So that means James would want to wager in a way so that he's left with 4,400 if he's wrong. So he could wager 8,200. And if he's wrong, he'll end up with 4,400. If he's right, he'll have 20,800, which will put him in the lead and in control of his own destiny in Final Jeopardy. Now, what's another scenario? He could wager. 2600 and misintentionally putting him down to 10,000. Not optimal, but it's still a possibility. One other thing he could do? 
he could wager 4,000, which if he got it right, would put him exactly halfway between first and third, which is a tie scenario for the leader. This has been a lot of fun, and I hope you've learned a lot in today's installment. We still have a few things to cover, so stick around for part five of the final wager. We'll see you soon.